Hey, Vice City family. I want to introduce our guest preacher for the morning. It's Pierre Cannings. Uh, he's been here before. He's the assistant pastor at Living Word Fellowship, and he's also the brand new dean of Dallas Seminary at Houston. He's married to his wife, Monica, and they've got three kids, and he's like a spiritual little brother to me. He's such a dear and close friend. Would you please welcome Pierre Cannings this morning at Vice City Fellowship? Well, good morning, Bayou City Fellowship. Hello, my good people. So let's get the cat out of the bag really quick. I know I am overdressed. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. Secondly, last time I was here, they played Jamaican music or Caribbean music on my way up. I see y'all have modified your approach. I still like that Caribbean music. My parents are from Guyana, South America for a reason. However, I am happy to be back. So twofold, we are Pope is swapping today. So Icky is now having his beautiful experience at Living Word Fellowship Church as we speak, so y'all pray for him. Um, and then I get to be here, obviously, with the best church in the city of Houston at Bayou City Fellowship. So I have to reintroduce myself in a way because Dr. Yarbrough made sure I would say this, or let me say like this, he made sure that on a phone he mentioned this. Um, he had a wonderful experience here at the Story of Scripture at Dallas Theological Seminary. He wanted to say he knows this is an amazing church, and he looks forward, hopefully, to coming back and visiting you soon. So as the new dean of Dallas Theological Seminary, I had to reintroduce myself in that facet, although that's not what matters. However... What does matter, I'm fixing to date myself, and this is going to be quick, as fast as I can go. Um, what does matter is that somehow, in the beauty of the Word of God, I point you to who God is, and then I get out the way. Y'all remember when we were in elementary school before all these cool screens and HDMI cords and all this mess that they have? We used to have these things called transparency sheets. Y'all remember that junk? <laughs> okay. And y'all remember they put it on the thing, and then the, the teacher would sometimes write on it. Um, my prayer for you today is that, and it's going to sound hopefully correct, my prayer is that the Word of God is written on that transparency sheet, and all I want to do is project the glory of God for you. So I'm going to get out the way, because I want y'all to see the words written on the page and not me, and my prayer is that everyone gets to experience the beauty of the Word of God, and that that light just projects into your life exactly what you need to learn today. So therefore, I am out of your way, and hopefully into God's. And hopefully you are here as well for that reason. Can we pray together? Dearly Father, we thank you because you are an amazing God, an awesome God, all by yourself. The craziest thing is that you don't necessarily need me, but for some reason you chose in your grace to use me. So therefore, I want to say that I am thankful, humbled, and privileged. However, I do pray for my heart, for the purity of my heart, that everything that I say comes from the purity and for the glory and the exaltation of your name. I pray for the hearts of your people, that their hearts are soft and moldable, that the seed that is thrown is not laying by the wayside, but for immediate growth and longevity. That your word we already know is powerful and is sharper than a double-edged sword. So my job is hopefully to deliver a double-edged sword because I already know you're gonna do the work in your people's life. God, I pray that we are ready to be cut by you because we know you're going to stitch us together and make us whole. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some personal stuff today. I don't know about you, but I like rain. I actually, I'm going to go a little further, I like storms. Storms are to me, even though the inner thug in me... Um, who doesn't want to admit this, but there's something about a storm that makes you want to cuddle. I don't, it's just something there. <laughs> don't judge me. But it's the pitter-patter on the window that gets you. But my wife, in her, all her glory, decided, hey, you know, we need to build a patio. Now, I don't know why you build a patio in Houston. It's 104 degrees. And then you have to buy a fan. That doesn't work. And then it has those little foldy things. You know, the fan dies, and it just looks like it's just melting. But we have a fan out there, and then the storm came, and we got to sit on the patio, and she wanted to talk, and I just wanted to sit, and that's cool. And uh, we got a chance to enjoy the storm. 
And in the storm, you can get breaks. I don't know if you know about Houston, but in those clouds, you'll get a break. And in that break of that cloud, you can still see the sun is still present. In the break of the cloud, uh, while sitting in the patio, while, yes, I was listening to my wife, I saw that the sun had never disappeared the whole time. My prayer for you today is that in this sermon, I'll remind you of two things, that even though some of us are going through our clouds and our storms, one, the sun is not gone. Our God is still present. So even though there's an overcast, it does not necessarily mean it should be casting a shadow on your life. Number two, is that you are sitting under the protection of God. So even though you're outside, even though you can know it's raining, and even though you know the storm exists, does not mean the patio for your life has not been built. So yes, you may get some directional rain that hits your feet. You may even feel the wind gust and you may hear the thunder, but that doesn't necessarily mean that God is absent and you're not protected. So my prayer is as we read the beautiful book of Habakkuk, chapter three, verse 16, is that you will be excited to know that the storm won't last always. So for those who are going through their anxiety, their fear, their depression, but also if you get the historical background, you'll know there was more than just a personal touch to the sermon. That this sermon was a lament. This sermon was a lament over what was coming and also a lament of what was happening in the country itself. So therefore, in order to set the precedent, I thought it'd be wise for me to read chapter one. And then I would wonder how many of us have had this same prayer. That not only personally we have our own storms, but the country in itself has its own storm, and then the world in itself has its own storm. How many of us have cried over those in Ukraine, cried over those stuck in sex trafficking, cried over those stuck in the foster to adoption system? How many of us have said, God, when and why? Why in my personal life? When will you change it? When, why is Ukraine happening? Why is the sex trafficking happening? Why are these all these sinful problems surrounding me. My prayer is today I can answer your question without answering your question. Then in chapter one, verse one, he says, how long, O Lord, will I call for help? Mm. And watch these words, and you will not hear. I cry out, you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see this iniquity? How many of us have looked throughout just Houston itself and said, how long will this violence exist? How long will I sit here and see people be mistreated and see injustices and see oppression? And how long? So he's talking about his country right now, Judah right now, and all the disparities of what are happening in his own country. But then he also know an invasion is coming. So God has to answer his question, and an answer of his question is not the answer anybody would want. Because I, last time I checked, any time I ask God how long, I want a timely answer. Like, hey, I'm going to fix this problem tomorrow after you send that angry email to your coworker. <laughs> you know what I mean. It's the Christian way of cussing through email. Per my last email. That literally means go read. <laughs> go read. And many of us are like, God, the when is now. The how is how I see it. But if you would read the rest of the, the book, you would know, which I can't because we're on a timely fashion and I can't go in my African-American ways. It will be quick. <laughs> it's something simple. Is that God answers by saying, hey, Babylon is coming. It will destroy Assyria and also destroy the Egyptian rain is falling, the Assyrian rain is falling, Babylon's cunning, coming, but coming to take you captive. What? That's the answer? You thought that was comforting? And how many of us said, God, this is your answer for me to wait? How is that comforting? So the answer is no? How is that comforting? How many of us have wondered why God would say no and expect you to somehow come to church and be happy? But watch chapter 3, verse 16. After God answers Habakkuk, I love his resolve. So my prayer, when you leave here, you will leave with the same resolve. He says, I heard. That's the first part we're going to focus on. I heard. I know that sounds weird. This is just DTS all over again. You're in seminary. You ready? I heard. The first problem with Christianity is some of us ask questions but don't wait for an answer. 
The first problem with our faith is our faith is in our answer to God. So when he answers, we're going to disagree automatically because it's not the answer we wanted. But some of us, if we practice hearing instead of talking, have you ever did your prayer life but did it silently? It, this is a hard one. Many of us, when we think about prayer, the moment we think about prayer, we think about telling God what we want. Like this was an upward movement, but it never comes downward. But the love, what I love about this verse, he said, I heard your answer. Uh, let's go back to storms. How many of us have ever been on a plane? And in that plane, you start feeling it. You know you're feeling it. And nobody, nobody wants to act uncool on a plane. You have to maintain your thug ways. So even though you're gripping it and you are literally killing that, that hand rest, and you know you're trying to share with that person next to you, there's rules to that, by the way. I travel all the time. There is rules. If you're on the window, you only get a little half or you get zero. You got to lean on the window. If you're in the middle, you're supposed to get both. We'll leave it alone. <laughs> then all of a sudden, in the midst of that turbulence, what happens? The pilot hops on. Or the co-pilot, nobody knows who's talking. It's like a calm voice. And he says, hey, guys. And he says the obvious, which is just horrible. Hey, guys, we're in a little turbulence. But have you ever noticed their voice is never in a panic? Because if I was a pilot, probably for Spirit Airlines, I'd be like, hold on for your life! <laughs> Spirit Airlines, bad experiences. Cheap, though. Better know how to pack those clothes tight. <laughs> I'd be like, hold on for your life, we're gonna die! But the pilot's like, little turbulence. Uh, everything's going to be okay. I'm going to put on the sign for the fastened seat belt. I just need you to fasten that a little tighter today, and we're going to just escalate to 1,500 feet. Is everybody okay? It's beautiful. <laughs> it's calming. Your, your, your hand starts to let go of the post because you believe the pilot has just spoken, and if he's okay, you should be okay. So how come when God talks to us throughout the word of God, we don't let go of the hand rest? We have a pilot who never, never wrecks a plane. He's always landed. He has a 100% record of never failing, no matter if he's taking you through a storm. So why in the world would you grip the hand rest and not go to sleep on the window seat? Why wouldn't you just be like, if he's good, I'm good? But you know, you're not out of box. You're not out of the plane. Guess what? The disciples did it too. The storm was around them. They started throwing things overboard. Guess what God was doing? He was asleep. The question for everyone is, will you go to sleep after you hear? Or how many of us are wrestling in our beds, can't sleep, keep crying, nothing's wrong with crying, we'll talk about that in a second, and we will what? Stay up at night holding on to the hand rest of life. Saying, God, I need you to fix my husband. I need you to fix my wife. I need you to fix this. When are you going to fix jobs? When are you going to fix finances? And God is like, let go of the hand rest. I'm flying right now. Because right here, he says, my inward parts. Oh, I got to be careful with how long I take. It said, my inward parts trembled. This is what I think is missing in church. And this is just my thing. It's not Bayou City. It's just living word. Y'all can, y'all rest easy. is when God speaks, what happened to us trembling on the inside? Whatever happened to that such reverence for the fact that God still wants to talk with you that it doesn't take a preacher to motivate you? When is the last time a sermon didn't emotionally trigger you and we're waiting for that emotional trigger for us to be obedient? And God's like, anytime I speak to you, your inward parts should start to what? Go into, this word means a restless motion. It's weird, watch this, that we'll go into a restless motion because of the circumstances of our world, but won't go into a restless motion when our God speaks about the world. Like, we, we will go, oh, I can't sleep, what's going to happen? And our God's like, I'm talking to you. But because we've made Jesus our homeboy, and yes, I remember, 1990s, the worst shirt ever, because I remember that, we have now started to refer to God as a friend, and we forgot he was authority. That some of us have said, oh, you know, we're going to be okay. I'm going to talk to Jesus. He's my friend. He is your friend, but he's also God. And when he speaks, I want it to wrestle you up. I want you to say, like, God, I can't believe it, because watch what I'm fixing to say. Did you, hear his, did you hear his lament earlier in chapter 1? This man was like, where are you, and how long do I have to be here for this? If I was God, I'd be like, hey, man, look, this conversation over. We're done. 
It's like when your kid talks back, right? You're like, mm-mm, nah, fam. You forgot whose car you're in. I don't know what house you were raised in. My mom would say things, this is our house, this is my house, and you can see your way out. I was like, I'm four, what am I gonna do? <laughs> I'm gonna survive in these streets? Uh, Katy, Texas was rough. <laughs> but if I was God, I'd be kicking people out the house all day. But here's the beautiful part about God still talking to you, is that even after your week, even after our sin, even after our questions, even after our telling God we're done, God still talks to you and he's not done. Do y'all see the beauty of that? Do y'all see that even you being in this sermon, not because I'm preaching because I know Icky's better, uh, not because I'm here. I'm telling you, isn't it beautiful that despite the sin we've committed all week because nobody is perfect, including myself, God is still graciously saying, hey, we're going through some turbulence right now. I'm going to talk to you. You should be in revelation. You should be excited that your God lets you open up his word and let him speak. You should tremble on the inside. He says later on that my lips are quivering. Can you imagine him just shivering to the fact that God responded? And then he says, my bones feel like they're in decay. Have you noticed that everyone who ever had an experience with God has some inward movement? Hear me out. Is that in American Christianity, we want outward movement. But God, when every time they encountered the word of God, they had an inward problem. Isaiah, hey, I need you to clean my tongue. I'm not supposed to be here. Moses, hey, I'm not supposed to be here. Take off your shoes. There was a response to the word in the presence of God. But for some reason, we have made the word of God so casual that many of us walk in and walk out. No inward responsibility. No inward decay. No bones feeling like I'm not supposed to be here. No lips quivering at the fact that God is talking to you. Isn't that crazy that almighty God is interpersonally interacting with you? even though he has some amazing things to do. Everyone who's encountered God encountered change, but for some reason our country and our world encounters God with no change. Have you ever noticed there's one last response to this? And I pray this is one of my favorite parts of the sermon and I'll have to go faster. You ever been on the island? If you know anything about islands, obviously Caribbean background, the, the, the islands are like seven miles. They're not like long islands, like seven miles and stuff like that. So you, you, the storm can come. But if you're smart, street smart, Caribbean smart, you can stay and the storm's going to pass, right? So as you walk into the crowded beaches, you kind of want to pray for the storm. Why? Because that means everybody who took your spot for your tanning section is going to leave because they're not Caribbean smart. Let me explain. When the storm comes, you can look. And for many people, what do they start to do? They start to pack up their umbrellas. They start to pack. Now, I don't tan. There's a reason why. Okay? My wife is Caribbean. I mean, my wife is Argentinian, so she tans. And as a husband, it's my job to be present and burn to death and turn purple at the same time and act like I'm reading books and enjoying conversation. Now, I'm hot, baby. We absorb heat. I'm, <laughs> Sorry, there's some, obviously some counseling I need to go through now. <laughs> so the storm starts to come and everybody starts to pack it up. They're going back to their hotel rooms. It's over. My tanning session is over. But not me and my wife. We just start to move our towels forward. Get that better spot. You moved your fault. Can't come back to it. And I wonder how many of us are packing up our Christianity after we see the storm. Not realizing that it's only a seven mile storm. But some of us won't come to church anymore. We'll stop serving in church because the church hurt. We'll stop doing things at our jobs. We'll stop being a witness. Stop sharing the gospel because people have hurt us. We'll stop sharing the gospel with our own family. We've cut people out of our lives. We have said, I'm not gonna tolerate this. And we've created boundaries that shouldn't be existent. We have done things to pack our Christianity up and make ourselves comfortable again. So therefore, the hardest question you should be asking is what things have I done to pack up my faith? What showers have I taken to take off the sunscreen even though all I had to do was watch these next word, wait? He says, after not only my inward parts trembled, he said, oh, I have to wait because I must wait. Oh, quietly. Oh, a lot of people, a lot of them extroverts didn't like that next word. 
How many of us struggle to sit and wait on God? To know the storm is coming and to wait while he pushes clouds out of the way? How many of us struggle to say, God, I'm here, I'm okay? How many of us struggle to stay in our marriages and stay in our singleness and stay in our abstinence and stay in these places where we're uncomfortable and wait on God to move? The crazy thing about this story is he was already moving and he told Habakkuk he is going to move. So guess what Habakkuk could only do? Wait, there's nothing else I can do. How many of us resolve to surrender that there's nothing else you can do? Hear me out. Is that some of us are fighting battles and there's nothing else you can do about it. And then we complain to God of how tired we are and God is looking at you like, I never told you to fight. I never told you to go fight this battle at work. I never told you to go hold this hour-long meeting with your wife trying to change her. I never told you to go find a man on Tinder. That was your decision. You kept swiping left. I said, wait. Some of y'all didn't get that. <laughs> Tinder is a dating app. I'm sure. All right. And God is looking at you and saying, we just wait, but not only will you wait, Habakkuk resolved, I'll wait and I'm done talking. If you look at the rest of the verses, guess what happens? The book ends. It's over. It's three chapters long. So he kept his word. He was done. So how many of you need to go to bed tonight and be done? You've told God what you want. You told him the desires of your heart. Even the Holy Spirit has grumbled for you because of your tears. You can't even get words out anymore. You've been crying so much in your depression and your anxieties and your fears. And God is like, I heard you. Are you willing to wait on my answer, though? I heard your tears. Are you willing to wait and be quiet? Because I understand you're praying persistently, but, I, but then I'm going to say this last thing that may hurt your feelings. Sometimes we are. Hold on. Sometimes we are asking for things that God has already answered. Hear me out. That we're praying persistently for things that God's already told you no to, yes to, or wait to. And you're like, God, no, yeah, I didn't like your answer. So the reason why we keep opening our mouths is not because God hasn't answered you. It's because you don't like the answer. You don't like the fact that things haven't changed at your house, so you're going to keep praying for your wife to change. Keep praying for your husband to change. Keep praying for the church to change. Keep praying for the country to change. And God's like, I am in control because watch the next words. How do I know this? Watch the geographical and battle invasion coming. He says, I will be quiet for the peoples who arise will invade us. Do you imagine, hear me out, how you're waiting quietly? He's not waiting quietly while he doesn't have an army coming. He's saying the army's coming and I'm still going to be quiet. Have you ever noticed when people get close to battle, they start to talk more? How do I know that? Go all the way back to Exodus chapter 14, and what happens? They're sitting in front of the Red Sea, even though he just showed them the plagues. Isn't this crazy? He showed them that he wanted them to escape. We're going to get there in a second. And on top of that, now he sees the Egyptians coming. The Egyptians are coming. People start to murmur, grumble, and complain. He says, hey, I need y'all to be quiet and then watch God work. I talked to God. He told me to raise a stick. No matter how crazy that sounds, I'm going to raise it, but I need all of y'all to be quiet and then watch our God work. Some of us, the, we talk the more the enemy gets closer. We like to complain the more the problem gets closer and closer to our lives. We like to tell God how bad of a decision he made by allowing the storm to be in your life. And God is telling you, they're coming, but you can still be quiet. You know what I've learned? The most persistent problems is what we often talk about. How many of y'all will be in a conversation, we're talking about something totally different, and all of a sudden you're going to bring up the same problem from last week? Am I, am I lying? We've all been in that marriage spot where, like, somebody let things go and somebody didn't, and you're over there eating and enjoying your nuggets, and all of a sudden, boom. She's like, you remember last week? And I'm like, oh, my God, bless our souls, because we're back. <laughs> And me too, I'm the same way, we're back. We're back at this thing I keep bringing up and God's like, why are you bringing up something that you can't stop? It's here now. The only thing you could do is bank on the God who has a plan. And you know what God's plan was? To let them invade. Because he needed a discipline of people who turned their back on God 
and it had injustices and oppression happening in the country, in a place of Judah that was never supposed to happen. We don't want to talk about the relevance to what we have going on in our, in our country, but it's not supposed to happen. So he let Babylon be the place of discipline so they would turn back to God. That was the plan. But you know what sounds bad about that plan? That plan includes this thing called suffering. And the problem with Christianity, especially American Christianity, is that we don't preach that sometimes in your faith you will suffer. And because we preach that everything's going to work out and you're not going to have problems once you turn to Jesus, we have preached such a false Christianity that when people encounter the real Christianity, they run from it because we never told them some of your faith will involve invading. They will invade your personal space. They will invade your selfishness. They will invade what you think is right. They will invade your country that you think should be one way or the other. And God is like, I'm trying to change you more than I'm trying to change the country, but let's move on. Because I know why. Because watch this quick run through of Habakkuk's understanding of what's going to happen. This is when you knew he knew. He says, though the fig tree should not blossom. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this in a regression or an ex acceleration order is the best choice. We're going to start out small, and then I'm going to build you up to realizing that Habakkuk understood what's going to happen. Fig trees weren't that bad of a deal. If you lose fig trees, it's like losing, I don't know, coffee. Now, for some of us, that's a big deal, <laughs> especially me, okay? But fig trees were a delicacy. So what he was saying is we're going to lose our fig trees. So what would you say if you're going to lose your feet? Like, oh, all right, God, you took away the 403B, but I still have a 401 and a 529. <laughs> Looking good. It's like taking away your stocks, right? You're like, okay, I lost the stocks, but I still got this. So nobody's complaining. Then all of a sudden, he goes a little further. He says, and there will be no fruit on the vines. So better yet, the better way to explain it to you, there's no wine. We can't pick and make our wine. Yes, do we want our wine? Does, does a meal taste better with something to drink that has taste and not water? Absolutely. But he's like, hmm, it's wine. I've seen some. I've been to some fancy restaurants. I saw some people sniff the cup. It makes sense. I don't know what you're sniffing, but I'm sure it's doing something. <laughs> but then it goes further. He says, and the yield of the olive should fail. Now we're getting a little closer to home. They used to use the olive for what? Baking. They needed it to make their bread. So now I'm getting a little closer to home. Now your 403 and your 401 is gone. Now your health isn't the same as it used to be. And he said, and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the field, and there, shall, there will be no cattle in the stalls. You see how accelerated that got? So this is the reason why I did the acceleration for you, is that some of us are comfortable losing what we've created comfort in. This is going to make sense. We'll still stick with God as long as he doesn't take away what's close. But the moment and the closer he gets to your comfort level is the faster and faster we're like, oh, no, God. Now you're too close. How do I know that? My daughter. When I was in the hospital and they thought she had Down syndrome, nothing wrong with the beauty of what God has created. I love the fact that I got to experience what love really looks like in that moment. But I started to list my resume to God. I would not worship God. I was like, mm-mm. God, you, I, I did everything right. I stayed a virgin until I was married. I started listing everything. Do you know how hard that was, God? We were in college. <laughs> I'm a youth pastor serving faithfully. I'm at Dallas Theological Seminary. I stay up till 3 in the morning studying your old word. And then they thought my daughter and my wife had breast cancer. And I'm in the waiting room crying. Can't hold back tears. How could you take my wife's health? Take mine, not hers. So I started listing my resume again. You're too close for comfort, God. See, you never really realize your faith until you get this uncomfortable, right? Because everybody's cool when you're comfortable. It's when God makes you uncomfortable, that's when you realize what faith you really have. It's when your marriage is on the rocks is when you realize what kind of husband you really are. It's not when it's great. Have you, never, you ever noticed on vacation, nobody's really like, everybody's happy. 
Most of the time. I've seen some bad situations. <laughs> it's only when life hits you back in your face do you realize what kind of things you really have. Let's do this last thing real quick and I'll move and I'll get to the last point. I'm going to say this hard point because sometimes we need a storm to realize who we are. There's a drought, right? Y'all know that. Some of y'all have sprinkler systems. You know what's happening. And the water bill lately, the inflation is real. See, I really don't know how you get inflation on water, but we're not going to talk about that. Like, <laughs> it's the same water as last time. How did you raise the price? But we're going to get off of that. But it's not until you realize there's a drought do you realize how much you need a storm. And I'm fixing to tell y'all today that sometimes in our lives, we don't realize that our faith needs a storm so we can realize there was a drought. That your spiritual walk was in a drought status. And when you see the storm, you're realize like, man, I didn't know how much I needed God. I didn't realize how much I needed this storm. I didn't realize how much I needed to see that there was a problem in order for me to realize I needed water. And some of us today, I hope it's a revelation to you, you need to see that your faith in your comfort is not the same it is in its discomfort. Welcome to a drought. But I'd rather teach you about a drought than you have to experience it in your life. Hmm. We'll conclude with this beauty. Because after he lists, after he lists every problem that's coming, my prayer is this, this is your resolve as well. It says, yet I will. Can I make this your prayer today? I hope that in your life, excuse this French, there is a whole bunch of buts. Be careful. I see the problem, God, but. I see the fact that my life is not where I want it to be, yet. I see the fact that I'm still struggling with anxiety and fear, yet. I see the fact that my marriage isn't where I want it to be, yet. My prayer is that some of us in this sanctuary who have been waiting for God to do something before this next step, you got it backwards. Is that some of us have a backwards Christianity. We wait on God to do what we want before this yet word comes. I want Bayou City Fellowship to be able to have their butt before the situation changes in your life. Because he said this word that many of us need to hear, yet I will exalt. The word exalt is not just say, mm, praise him. No, the word exalt, look how deep this word goes. It means that I have, watch these words, triumph. Isn't that crazy? That he's fixing to lose and he's saying, I still got triumph. How do you do that? How do you know you're losing your health right now and say, God, you're still triumphant? How do you say, man, I see my marriage is failing and I'm still triumphant? It's because you recognize you have a God who never loses. That you may lose a battle, but you're not going to lose a war. And you realize, God, I'm willing to say I am triumphant even when I feel like my life is lost. And when you get there, that's when you know where your faith is. That's exactly when you know that you are a truly believer in who God is, that in the midst of your battles, no matter where they come from, you're going to say, God, I am triumphant. My marriage will be triumphant. My singleness will be triumphant. This, uh, this abstinence phase in my life will be triumphant. I know that I am triumphant because even though there's a storm, there's still a sun. The last time I check, I'm not just talking about a sun that beams in our sky. I'm not talking about a gas ball. I'm talking about Jesus has been triumphant the day he died on the cross for your sins and gave you access into the throne of God. I'm talking about a Jesus who took the crown of thorns, put it in his head, took the nail, shoved it into his wrist, took his feet, crossed them over, and made sure they bludgeoned between his bones. And he sat on the cross while thinking about you, knowing at that moment he made you victorious. Knowing at that moment you never had to worry about life or death anymore. So you can walk into any situation saying, hey, it's not what I want, but I'm still triumphant. The only resolve I have is that my God doesn't lose. Even when I feel like I'm personally losing. How many of us have loved somebody to the point where you thought you were losing in the relationship? This is a hard one. How many of us have ever loved somebody so hard where they took advantage of you? You're like, I'm losing God. 
And God's like, you're not losing because the love I'm giving you to give to somebody else is triumphant. It always wins. Hmm. The word exalt also means in another connotation, an emotion of joy which finds expression in singing and in shouting. Now I know you might think shouting is outside the realm of Bayou City Fellowship. <laughs> but for a second, I'm gonna give you a glimpse of Living Word Fellowship Church. <laughs> There's this lady named Miss Birdie. Miss Birdie has been struggling with cancer for years. And all I hear in the back of the church is somebody shouting. You would think it would be me, Dean of Dallas Theological Seminary, fixing to finish his PhD. You would think it would be me who was shouting because life is good, healthy marriage, healthy kids. You think it would be me. It's not me. It's the lady with cancer. And you can't stop her from having joy. You can't stop her from shouting and singing. She is the loudest person in the church despite her cancer. That is the faith that I want. So as a pastor, I'm watching somebody else have more faith than me. I'm fixing to go preach a sermon and she has more faith than me. So some of us, I need you to be able to see the cancer in the world and in your life and be able to say, God, I need you. And she says words that I wouldn't say. I need you make sense, but hallelujah doesn't. God, heal me. That makes sense. Shout that out. Be Bartimaeus. That makes sense. But not, oh, give you glory. But the words she shouts is not those words where you're like, oh, that makes sense. The words she shouts are the words that you're like, why in the world would you say that now? She's shouting through a mask because she can't get sick, and yet she's still at church. And I can still hear her. Where is that faith in the church where we can go through our worst and still give God our best? The next word he uses in the Lord, and he said, I, I wish I had time. The word Lord means to be somebody who rules and is master over. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. He doubles down is the best choice of words. He pushed all his chips into the table and then doubles down with another word is the best choice of word. He said, not only will I exalt, or remember, this is on the eve of the invasion. It's not like, hey, it's coming for years and he has time to think. This is on the eve, people believe, before the invasion. And this man says, not only will I exalt you, I will rejoice in you. So the word faith is not, the word joy is not only here. He says, I will shout in exaltation. The rule of the word means the circle of joy, that I will be circling in joy, that I have a vigorous, enthusiastic expression of joy. But the problem with Christianity is that we have confused happiness with joy. Happiness is external circumstances that affect your emotional mood. So many people wait to walk into church to get happy. Happiness is an external response. It's an internal response to an external situation. Joy is from the inside because it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if I walk with the Holy Spirit, I experience the expression of joy. So even though the external circumstances do not match my internal joy because it has to come from what God gives me, it also joy comes from the recognition of who God is. So therefore, if God is who he says he is and I walk according to what he is in me, I can have joy no matter what's happening. So you can walk in your house, you can walk into an argument, you can walk into your job that you've been hating for years, and still have this inner expression, not of happiness, but of exaltation. So you can worship while at your job. You can sit there and laugh and smile because you know your God is still in control because he is triumphant. You don't have to wait anymore is what I'm saying. So even if you have no answer, you still have joy. Even if the answer is no, you still have joy. Even if you're saying, God, I don't like your answer, it's still joy because I know you're still God. But the problem with Christianity is we wait till God to answer our prayer request before we walk into church rejoicing. So therefore, it has to be a good week, and then Sundays are good, and God's like, I'm always good no matter your week. 
Sundays aren't an expression of how good your week went. Sundays are an expression to give me glory no matter what you went through because I'm still good. But we have to motivate. Sermons have to be great. Preach your heart out, pastor, and make it good, funny, entertaining with seven illustrations. You better get to work. And if you're not sweating when you're done, even with good AC, you haven't preached yet. But then he says, the God of my salvation, mm, that a God of, why in the world would he say of my salvation when he's not going to be saved? Did you get that? Physically, he's not going to be saved, but he calls him a God of salvation. So therefore, I have this last thing I will say, is that even if God is not saving you from the circumstances that you want him to save you from, he's still a God of salvation, meaning there are still things that you can't see he's saving you from. And if you don't see those things, then maybe you need to remember what he did on the cross because that's still saving work. And guess what? Sometimes we're begging God to save us from our circumstances and you should be the salvation for someone else. But because we become so self-centric and when we're going through problems, nobody else experiences God's salvation because we're too captivated with self. But what if somebody needs you right now? What if somebody needs to experience who God is, but you're too busy, worried about the fact that you don't like your job? And you leave every coworker that needs Jesus out of the equation of the gospel because you hate your cubicle. So how can they experience God's salvation if all you're focused on is the cubicle at hand? Mm, I'll move on. The Lord God is my, watch these words, strength. I got to be quick. Right now, I still preach at my church every Sunday, still serve there as much as I can, but I obviously transfer to Dallas Theological Seminary. This strength word is critical because I'm, I'm, if I'm honest, I feel like I'm failing in strength. Like even this sermon is God's strength. This is my sixth sermon in five days. And it's not to brag, because people always brag about busyness when busyness is not what God wanted. He wants a Mary, not a Martha. So I'm not bragging. I'm actually confessing. Okay? So don't take this the wrong way. But the word strength doesn't mean that all of a sudden you feel better. You know what strength really means? Watch these definitions so you can have it. Four later. It is, watch these words, it is the capability or the enabling to function in God's power. However, he just enables you to do it, but if you don't use it, and you use your own strength, you're going to fail. So therefore, reason why people pray before they preach, because they should be relying on whose strength? The reason why you pray before you walk into church, before you serve after a long day, before, is because many of us, we're failing because we keep forgetting that it's not your strength you need in the first place. Many of us forget that our marriages need God-like strength. Our singleness needs a God-like strength. Our jobs need the capability for God to work through your weakness. But if we keep working through our own weakness and trying to develop our strength is when you fail. The number one thing in leadership PhD, they tell you, find somebody who has your weakness, meaning that, that is strength in your weakness. Don't try to become it. Find someone. So therefore, I'm telling you today, don't try to become and fix every weakness in your life. The last time I checked, he said, my grace is perfected in your weakness. Because in my weakness, God gets glory because it shows his power. But many of us spend so much time fixing our weaknesses and functioning in our weaknesses rather than saying, God, do the work. And he has made me like hind's feet and makes me walk in high places. I wish I had time, but the bottom line is, wow, if you ever watch a deer, something about those hind's legs that are sturdy. But the, what I loved about the passage was not the fact that he was sturdy in the midst of the storm. What I loved about the passage is somehow he said high place. Isn't that ironic? Because the last time I checked, if somebody come to kill me, that's a valley. <laughs> that's like a Robert Van door. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. No, 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 no. Dead boat. <laughs> it's a bad place to be in. But no, he says, I am in a high place. 
You know the only way that you can feel like you're in a high place? If you remember you have a high God. That's the only way. The only way for you to call a valley a mountain is to remember you have a God who could take you to a mountaintop. But if you keep dwelling in your valley and forget that God is the one, not only is he with you in your valley, but he can take you to a high place, even no matter your circumstances, that is when you experience the high God. This is what I love about storms. I told you it was a storm passage. But my kids, they're different. They're amazing. When, have you ever noticed when kids see a storm, it's like an energizer to make your house like, because everybody's supposed to come inside. But for some reason, they get more energy now that they're stuck inside. And then they start asking really amazing questions. <laughs> Can we go outside? And I was raised in a very African-American home that was under the belief, false belief, I think I heard from a doctor, <laughs> that if you get wet, you automatically get sick. My dad has three hats in his car because he believes that if he protects his head from the rain, he don't get a cold. <laughs> but kids don't care. They look through the window and they see the storm and then all of a sudden they see something on the ground. They see puddles. Now for some of us who are bougie, they, they have rain boots. And like, mom, mom, can I put on my rain boots and go outside? And some of you who experience less bougie can I take off my clothes, wear my shorts, and go outside? <laughs> because they don't see a storm. They see an opportunity to run around and rejoice in the storm. They don't see the rain. They see puddles that they can jump in. They don't see the fact that it's storming outside. They see the fact that they can go jump on the trampoline and the water bounces with them. So they don't even care about the storm they care about the fact that they can rejoice because they know the storm won't last always. I might as well enjoy the storm then. So some of y'all, I'm asking a quick question. Is how many of us have learned to go jump in the puddles of our sorrow? How many of us have learned to go jump on the trampoline of our pain? Because you recognize, A, the pain won't last always, and B, my son is going to come out sooner or later. But then they ask the most dumbest question after that. Daddy, you coming outside? <laughs> I'm like, nah, let me get my hat. <laughs> I'm bald-headed. So today, I'm not your dad, but I'm asking you, will you come outside? Some of us have been locked in our rooms crying. Will you come outside? Some of us have been in pain too long and reckon you're giving up hope that God can be with you in your, the midst of your health, your marriage, your singleness. And I'm asking you today, will you come out side and jump in the puddles of God's glory. Let us pray. Dearly Father, we thank you for just who you are. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for who you are. But thank you most importantly for being sovereign. In total control despite our lack of so I tell you, I pray today for those who are in their storm right now that they will learn to exalt and rejoice. They will learn to wait after you've spoken. They will learn to end the chapter when you have done saying your answer. That they will learn that you, when you give the answer, not only is final, but it's good. So God, for those who need to let go today and enjoy and rejoice in the storm, for those who need just to find joy internally, I pray that you will convict them to the Holy Spirit. They will walk in your joy. At this time, Bayou City has asked me if you need prayer, the prayer team is ready and waiting for you. For those who are in the midst of saying, God, I, I'm lost, I don't know what to say, I wouldn't encourage you to find somebody to pray with. The, they're lined up against the walls and they would love to pray with you. This is your day to surrender. This is your day to say, God, thank you for being a God in the midst of the storm. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.